as we get going. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, again, my name is Monica McCubrey. If this is the first time that you are joining us, uh, this is called the Science of Webinar Series. So today this is our third um, installment of the series. I have you all on mute just so that you know. Um, you are welcome to have your videos on or off. It's up to you. Um, I will give about five minutes, uh, five, ten minutes at the end so that we can ask questions and we can interact with each other. Um, but if you have questions, just kind of hold on to those or type them in the chat box and I will certainly get to them um, at the end of the talk. So again, I'm going to be letting some people in here. So if I look distracted, that's why. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you. So today we're going to be talking about the science of bites and sting. So this one's a little bit different. This was actually kind of hard to research. There was a lot of information. So uh, we'll go ahead and get going on this. Um, we're going to let some people in here, the waiting room. All right. So uh, my name is Monica. I'm with the Nebraska Human Parks Commission. And today we're going to be talking about bites and sting. So first off, I want to talk to you guys today about something that we're going to come up with again and again throughout this talk. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys, um, venom versus poison. Before we even get going, I have a poll for you guys. If you want to answer it, you are more than welcome to. Um, now you're viewing something. How many poisonous snakes do we have in Nebraska? Do you guys want to answer this? I'm going to ask you guys, see what you kind of come up with here. How many poisonous snakes do we have in Nebraska? Zero, four, seven, or ten. It's up to you. I'll give you guys a couple minutes here to answer. That's a lot different than a lot of you think. All right, give you like 20 more seconds here, maybe like two more seconds actually. So it looks like most people have answered. Looks like answer is four. Um, close. We will talk about it here in a second. All right, so many of you said four was 68% uh, of people that said we have four of them. Um, well, to be honest, we have zero, to be honest. We'll talk about that here in a second. All right, so when we're talking about animals and bites and stings, there's two main different topics that we're going to cover today. There's something called venom and there's something called poison. So when we talk about poison, it is a toxin that gets into your body by either swallowing it, inhaling it, or absorbing it um, through your skin. So if you think about like poison ivy, if any of you guys have gotten poison ivy before, um, you touch it or you rub up against it and then you touch your arm, you touch your face, touch something and then you get those little red rashes and bumps all over your skin. So those are because of um, touching something um, or inhaling um, a chemical in the air or if you absorb it through your skin, it kind of depends, but that is all poison. Um, so when we talk about poison, these are things like uh, poison dart frogs, poison ivy, uh, toads. If you guys have ever watched uh, your dog or your cat or somebody in Nebraska um, grab a toad, sometimes the little white milky stuff comes out behind their neck on those hair toy glands. Those, that is poison. Um, you're touching it to making that come out. Um, your dog will be fine um, if they do swallow some of it. Um, they might foam with the mouth, but overall they're going to be fine. When we talk about venom, it is a specialized type of poison that has to connect with your bloodstream in some way. So when we talk about this, we're talking about snakes. Um, when we talk about snakes, we always, just in a second, always say venomous. Now there's always, always, always an exception in the animal kingdom. So when we talk about snakes are all going to be venomous, in Nebraska they are. We have four venomous snakes. So for those of you that said four, you were on the right track. Um, we don't actually say poisonous in Nebraska. Poison, remember, talks about inhaling or swallowing it or absorbing it. You're not probably going to swallow a snake, you're not going to inhale the snake, and you're not going to absorb the snake. So we are talking about venom that is being injected into the bloodstream. So snakes, spiders, bees um, are also venomous. And they're used interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. They are completely different from each other. So for, again, for you guys that are just joining us, we have four venomous species of snakes in Nebraska. But like I mentioned, there are always exceptions. There are a couple animals in the world. We don't have them in Nebraska, but there is something called a keelback snake that is both poisonous and venomous. And the blue ringed octopus is also poisonous and venomous. So if you are interested, you can certainly look those up. But again, we are talking about venom, uh, mostly venom today. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to bites. We're gonna talk about those first. 
So when we talk about animal bites, the first thing I always want to point out to people is that any animal could bite you. Um, they have mouth, they have a teeth, they could bite you. A raccoon could bite you, your dog could bite you, a ladybug could bite you, I could bite you. I have a mouth, I have teeth, and if you scare me or threaten me, I might, I might see a need to bite. Um, oftentimes when we talk about animal bites, they're going to come from your household pets. These are your dogs, these are your cats, maybe a ferret that you have, a hamster, something that you have mostly in your household. Um, but again, any animals can bite. And unfortunately, children are often the times the ones that are going to get bit the most because they're smaller, they're around the dog, they might be pulling on the dog's tail, they might be um, messing with the dog's toy. Again, a lot of these are often accidental, but there are some that are provoked. They often feel scared or nervous. There's many reasons that animals can bite. Um, uh, they also, when animals bite, they use their teeth. They put pressure on an area when they bite. So they're introducing saliva. They're introducing possible pathogens and diseases if they have them. Again, if my household dog bites me, they've been vaccinated and they're not going to give me anything. So maybe just a lot of saliva. Um, so some animals, when we talk about biting, they do insert or inject venom uh, when they do bite. So remember that venom has to come in contact with your bloodstream to have an issue with it. All right. First thing I want to talk to you guys today is about mosquitoes. I'm sure everyone has had a mosquito bite sometime in their life. Um, I have a bunch on my leg right now and they're kind of driving me nuts. So I totally understand this whole mosquito bite thing. Um, so if you haven't heard, female mosquitoes are the only ones that are going to actually bite you. The males, they don't need to. Um, so females have to do this because they need to produce eggs. And in order to do that, they need your blood. That is their food and they need food to make eggs. So a lot of times people, some people are more attracted to mosquitoes than others. Um, a lot of times it goes off by your body heat your perspiration, um, your body odor, lactic acid, that carbon dioxide that you're breathing out, those all attract mosquitoes. So a lot of the times that's why mosquitoes are biting you. Um, the female, a lot of the, for the longest time, scientists thought it was one large um, needle-like mouth part. Turns out that it's six, six different little needle-like mouth parts. Um, and you can see in the picture here, it's kind of neat um, because up until a few years ago, we had no idea that this was a thing. So two of those mouth parts are called the maxillae and they are used to actually saw through your skin. So when you get a mosquito lands on you, immediately they start sawing through your skin because there's a couple layers that they need to get through in order to get to your blood. Two of those are gonna be called the mandibles. So as they're sawing your tissue apart, they hold it apart and then one pierces into the blood and then the other one actually drips saliva into your bloodstream as what we call an anticoagulant. So if you've ever had a cut or something, you know that your blood eventually is gonna uh, clot after a while, well, this saliva that mosquitoes drip into your uh, bloodstream, it makes it not clot so that they can keep sucking and sucking and sucking your blood. So again, six individual little needle-like mouth parts um, and then instead of just one. So very interesting how they do that. All right, so mosquitoes, when you get bit by a mosquito, that saliva, that anticoagulant that they pump into your body, it causes you to get red, it causes you to itch, and sometimes they create little bumps on there. Um, some people react really bad um, to them more than others. I know that when a mosquito just bites me, it goes away in a few days. It's kind of itchy and kind of a pain. Um, but some people, it swells up, it gets really red. It kind of just depends on your body. Um, so after a mosquito bites you, some of that saliva remains in the wound. Um, those proteins, the, they invoke a, an immune response. So the very, very first time that you ever get bit by a mosquito, your body is like, what do I do? I, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. So they have to build that immune response to it. In the future then when you are bit, your body kind of knows what to do. And so it breaks down those proteins and the saliva that is from that mosquito. Um, mosquitoes can carry many types of diseases. Again, they're introducing those pathogens to you when they bite you. Um, so malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, Zika virus. Um, in Nebraska, we sometimes, uh, we don't really worry about yellow fever or malaria, but we do oftentimes worry about something called West Nile virus. Um, any animal can get it that's bit by a mosquito. A um, person could get it, a bird could get it, a dog could get it. Um, it's just different types of mosquitoes carry different types of pathogens. And again, in Nebraska, we don't not necessarily really at all have to worry about malaria or dengue fever or Zika virus. So, all right, so spiders. Um, so again, all spiders can bite. 
um, just like all animals can bite, although they rarely cause huge major problems. Um, there's just a couple that we'll talk about today that actually can cause serious issues. Um, but if a spider does bite you, you most of the time will not even know. Um, their fangs are too small um, or even too weak of pressure to puncture your skin. So a lot of times you might not even know that a spider bites you, but if you do, um, if you notice on like a mosquito bite, it's gonna be one bump because they have one insertation there. If you look at something like a spider, they have two fangs and they're gonna have two little puncture wounds. So if you guys notice this picture that I have here, that is a pretty significant spider bite. You obviously can tell that they had two fangs and exactly where those fangs were inserted or fit into your skin. Um, a lot of times your skin's gonna be red, it's gonna be itchy. Um, the only thing is that spiders are arachnids, so they have eight legs, they're not insects, which have six. Um, so they're gonna have a little bit longer of a heal time. So when they bite you or they insert their fangs into your skin, um, it causes an effect of the tissue around your skin. So instead of going all the way into your bloodstream, like a mosquito does, it's gonna be a little bit different. So it might take a little longer to heal, um, but they will eventually heal. All right, so the two spiders that we do not have to worry about in Nebraska, but we have seen in Nebraska before that cause significant damage. Um, I'm sure all of us have heard of a black widow spider. So as you notice kind of throughout my presentation today, we will talk a lot about the female animals for once. The female animals are the ones that are going to be the biters and the stingers. And we'll talk about why that is. But if you ever have seen a black widow or know what they look like, they have, they're usually black, the females are, and then they have a red hourglass figure on the bottom half of their abdomen, so the underside of their abdomen. Males are about half the size of females and they're not pretty. They're brown or gray, they look like a normal spider. Black widows have that significant, um, when you know a black widow when you see them because of that hourglass shape that's on their abdomen. They are found in Nebraska, but they're not very common. It's extremely rare to find one, but it does happen. Um, the venom that they have is what we call a nerve poison. It's more toxic even than the prairie rattlesnake, and that is probably one of the things that we have to worry about in Nebraska is rattle prairie rattlesnake venom. And I mean, I go out looking for them and I have a hard time finding them. So that tells you how you know, often rare they are. Um, so if you are bit by a black widow, you're gonna have severe pain. You might have elevated blood pressure. You might feel nauseous, difficulty breathing, um, but it goes away within a couple days and a week. And most people, they never have to go to the hospital for it. They're fine just kind of resting at home. Again, you should go to the hospital, um, but if you cannot get one, odds are that you'll recover from it in about a week or so. Um, so in Nebraska, we've only had four deaths from a black widow, and that was in the 60s. So it's been a really long time since we've had an issue with them. One that we see a little bit more commonly is something called a brown recluse spider. Um, so these spiders are pretty long-legged, if you notice in the picture here. And I, I know they're not the same spider, but if you've ever seen Arachnophobia, the old movie Arachnophobia, this is like the spider that I think of. They look very similar to the, the scary spider on Arachnophobia, but again, totally different. Uh, so these guys are often called violin spiders. Um, if you look at their uh, cephalothorax, which is their head and thorax combined in spiders, the back part there, um, it looks very black. It looks like a violin almost. So sometimes people call them violin spiders. Um, most people that are bitten by these animals, they like to hang out in clothes or pieces of clothing that are not used a lot and they like to hide up in under the sleeves, under the waistbands, armpits area. Um, so a lot of people that are bit by them, that's because they haven't worn clothes for a while and those spiders have gotten into their um, clothes area. So again, not very common, but it does happen. Um, if these spiders do bite you, um, it's gonna be an intense local pain. You're gonna get a large ulcer or a sore. It's gonna heal very slowly. Again, you can Google search these um, bites, but again, um, it's, it's going to be a spider bite. And it also will leave a large scar. Um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, I know we've had a couple um, issues with these spiders before. They have been in like apartment complexes. In my old high school, they were actually in the band lockers. So when kids would pull their band instruments out, they would often get bit. Luckily, that was after I was there, but it did happen. So they are something we have to worry a little bit more about than black widows, and these are still very uncommon in Nebraska. All right, everyone's favorite thing in the world, which are ticks. Uh, these little things are actually related to spiders. So they have eight legs, 
They're arachnids. A lot of people think they're insects, but they're actually related to spiders. Um, they can range in size from the small head of a pin all the way to a large pencil eraser. So, um, and it depends on how much they've eaten too is how big they're gonna get. So if you've ever walked through a bunch of grasses and you notice under your waistband or your um, sock, uh, ankle socks, you might notice some little tiny dots. That's how small they can get, the head of a pin. They can be very, very tiny, especially early in the springtime. Um, so what they will do is they will actually climb high on tops of grasses or shrubs and then they extend their legs. And then when something walks by, they grab onto them and hitch a ride um, onto their host. Um, they, what they will do immediately is search for a feeding site. So oftentimes when people tell you to do a tick check, this is places like under your armpits, your scalp, a lot of times behind your ears is where you're gonna find them. Um, they wanna make sure that they are inconspicuous, they don't get found, um, and they don't want a lot of attention. They wanna be somewhere where they are not gonna be found because if they can drink your blood. Um, at the largest size, ticks can be the size of a marble. So if you've ever looked at a um, dead deer or a possum or a raccoon or something on the side of the road, um, you might notice there's some ticks on them. They get fairly large because they're undisturbed and they can eat a lot. So they get fairly large. Um, attached ticks can remain up on your body for up to 10 days. So it takes about 24 hours, maybe 48 hours for a tick to actually attach to you. Um, once they attach to you and actually bite you, it's a problem because then it could possibly introduce that pathogen. So again, Lyme disease is something we have seen in Nebraska before, um, but it's, it's not that common. But again, you want to be able to get ticks off of you as fast as you can once you find them. All right, so one of my favorite things that we're going to talk about today are snakes. Um, so snakes do bite, but again, all animals can bite you. Only some of them are venomous. So when we talk about the grand scheme of snakes in the world, there's about 3,000 different types of snakes. Uh, 600 of those 3,000 are venomous, and 200 of those 600 um, actually cause medical damage, or they are extremely venomous or have enough venom to kill someone. So in the grand scheme of things, 200 out of 3,000 different kinds, it's not a huge bunch, but it's still a significant number. Um, so venom was evolutionarily designed not as a defense mechanism, but as something for an animal to grab its prey and to digest food. So it is a digestion aid for those animals. Um, it was not developed for a defense mechanism, but they have adapted to using it as a defense mechanism. So earlier in Nebraska, when we guessed, um, I said that there were four, I asked you how many poisonous snakes we have. Again, we have zero poisonous snakes. We have four venomous species. We have the timber rattlesnake, the prairie rattlesnake, the copperhead, and the western massasauga. Um, the three of them, the timber, the copperhead, and the western massasauga are found in extreme southeast Nebraska. And then the prairie rattlesnake is about the western half of the state. So fairly common-ish um, in rural areas and in meadows and on the sides of roads. Um, but again, still not that common, if that makes sense. I always have people ask me if we have water moccasins or cotton mouths, same thing. Um, we do not. Uh, we do not have them. We simply do not have the right habitat for them. I've had people say that they swim up from the, swim upstream from the Mississippi River. No, they do not. Um, you might have seen a northern water snake, which looks very similar to a water moccasin or a cotton mouth, but two totally different species. Nor northern water snakes are completely harmless whereas water moccasins or cotton mouths are very, are venomous. So, and we also don't have coral snakes. Um, those are found in the south uh, of the United States, Florida, Georgia, Alabama. Um, we do have something similar, it's called a milk snake. So similar species, similar coloring, um, but two totally different animals. So when we talk about snake bites, um, the World Health Organization estimates that there's about 5 million snake bites every year. We don't know exactly because there's a lot of people that don't report them. Um, places that are very rural um, or remote, they don't have a hospital two minutes away from them like I do right now. Um, they, they don't report those snake bites. So we estimate that there's around 5 million of them. 2.7 of them, a uh, million of them are actual envenoming. So when we say actual envenoming, that means venom has been injected into the bloodstream. Snakes can decide when they want to envenomate. So they could what we call dry bite. Um, so they could bite you and not inject venom or they could bite you and inject venom. It's just kind of their decision on how they feel. Um, between that, there's about 81 to 138,000 deaths per year. 
um, 400,000 amputations and other permanent disabilities from snakes. These are in places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, very remote areas. So um, World Health Organization actually considers in 2020 uh, snake bites to be a neglected tropical disease. Um, so in 2020, we're still having 5 million people um, have issues with snake bites. So clearly something needs to change with that. All right, so when we talk about snake bites, there's three different types of snake dentitions or the way that their teeth are oriented for them to bite. So the first one we're gonna talk about is rear fang snakes or opithoglyph. Um, it's hard word to say. So, um, but these are like our colubrid snakes. So colubrids are like 90% of all the snakes that are out there. These guys are rear fanged. Um, so if you look in the pictures, they have fangs towards the back that are curved in towards their, um, towards their stomach. Um, they're mostly harmless, but again, they can be venomous. One of the snakes that we have that is rear fanged in Nebraska is our Western hognose snake. So the cute little guy at the bottom here. Um, so to correctly insert their venom or inject their venom, they have to hold their prey and move it to the rear of their mouth. This is very hard to do, especially if they have larger prey. Um, so everyone that has held a Western hognose snake, you've held a venomous snake, but the venom is so, 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 so weak for us, we don't feel it. If you are a toad or a frog, it's a different story. But if a Western hognose bites you, you're fine. Um, they produce hemotoxins, um, which destroy red blood cells and they collapse the circulatory system. Um, so different types of venom cause different types of problems. So these rear fang snakes, we do have one of them in Nebraska, again, that Western hognose snake. We also have something called a proteroglyph. Um, these are venomous snakes that have fangs at the front of their mouth. They're not usually very long though. It's not like the stereotypical uh, prairie rattlesnake that you see. These snakes are gonna have very short teeth in the front, um, but they are gonna be in the front and they are gonna be fangs. They have to apply a lot of pressure to their bite, um, enough to be able to inject that venom. So these are the elapid snakes, um, which are things like cobras, sea snakes, um, their venom is a neurotoxin, so it de destroys the nervous system, which is a little bit different than a hemotoxin. Still toxins and still deadly, but different types and how they affect different things. Um, these guys are going to be the ones that are the most venomous of all vertebrates. So things like spitting cobras, things like sea snakes, things like king cobras, they have very, very short front fangs. Um, and things like a spitting cobra, they actually have front fangs that are modified to spray their venoms. They actually do spray um, when they contract their venomous gland muscles. So I have a picture over here, if you can kind of see it. Um, but if you look in the skeleton picture, their teeth are very small. They're not very big at all. Um, and they rely on that spitting. Um, the spitting cobras rely on that to um, kind of disable their prey for a second. All right, and then we have one more form of snakes. These are the stereotypical long fang snakes that you guys see in pictures um, or think of when you think of like a prairie rattlesnake. So these guys are called selenoglyphs and they are in the viper family. So their pair of maxilla are very, very shallow. Basically all they do is give support for those big fangs. So the uh, maxilla are gonna be the things that hold up your fangs in the front here. So it's kind of hard to see but they're right here. They're very short, um, different than other snakes. So when these guys um, bite, their fangs are actually folded up to the roof of their mouth when, they're, when they have their mouth closed. When they open their mouth, they open them and then the fangs actually slowly come down. Um, these snakes can penetrate really deep um, and they deliver large amounts of venom, but they're not as deadly as our proteroglyph. So, these have different, stronger toxins than the um, than these uh, uh, vipers. Sorry. All right. With bites, also comes bite force. So we're going to talk a little bit, really quickly, about bite force, and then we will move on to the sting. So when we talk about bite force, most people think, okay, you have really big teeth, you have really big mouth, you have to have a large bite force. That's not true. So animals need to have a powerful bite. They have to have a big mouth. They have to have strong teeth and those powerful, powerful muscles that are right here. So if all of you go like this, those muscles that you feel right here, those are the ones that contract that bite force. So not every animal with teeth can bite. 
I want you to think about that for a second because there is a snail that has a lot of teeth, but it doesn't bite. It doesn't have any muscles to bite or contract their teeth, but they do have teeth. Um, and a high bite force is also attributed to the enormous jaw muscles that a lot of animals have. So when we talk about that, one of the biggest animals that I think of as bite force is cats. So large, large cats like tigers, lions, mountain lions. They are built for killing prey. Um, they can open their mouths extremely large. They have very big teeth. They have huge muscles right here at the top and the bottom part of their jaw to be able to clamp down onto something. And they also have their muscles, which are attached, which is called the zygomatic arch, right underneath their eyelids. So that muscle is attached everywhere. They're huge, strong muscles that are able to have them up and down their mouth. Um, these guys can only open their mouth up and down. If you've ever watched a cow eat, you'll notice that they kind of move their mouth side to side. Cats can't do that. They just don't have the right jaw muscles or the musculature to do that. So they can only open it up and down. So one of the cats that we have in Nebraska, our largest predator, the biggest cat that's in um, North America is the mountain lion. So their skull is very short and round, if you've ever seen it. They have 16 teeth on the upper side, 14 on the bottom, and they have a very powerful bite because they have strong muscles. So if you look, they are called the masseter muscle, which is right here, and then they also have the temporalis, which is back here a little bit. We also have something called a sagittal crest. Um, so if you've ever pet your dog or seen a possum, you notice that they have a ridge that runs up and down their skull. That's their sagittal crest. Sometimes we call it smart bumps um, as far as dogs, um, but it's right here, the sagittal crest. That kind of holds everything together so that they ha can have that strong, strong bite force. All right, when we talk about canids, um, this is a little bit different. Um, when we talk about dogs, there are so many different types of dogs that it's hard to say which one is the better one because they do so many different things. Their hunting uh, techniques are different. Their sociality is different. Their cranial morphology is different. You talk about things like jackals, coyotes, your domestic dogs, bat-eared foxes, are, they only eat insects. So their cranial morphology is actually really weak compared to things like coyotes or your domestic dogs. Um, and when we talk about wolves, they eat totally different things than a jackal eats. So um, when we're talking about bite force, uh, your domestic dogs, if anyone wants to guess um, what the strongest bite force in any domestic dog is, it is the Rottweiler with uh, 300, about 328 pounds per square inch or PSI is what we call. The uh, German Shepherd is in short second, it is like 280 I think, so very close together. Um, and then we have something like coyotes. So even though coyotes are sometimes bigger, they don't necessarily have the strongest bite force. There's a study that I found that correlates um, the bite force with the brain volume. So the larger the brain volume, the larger the bite force. Um, the strongest bite force that belongs to any canid in the world is the gray wolf, which is 1,200 PSI or 1,200 pounds per square inch. So every square inch of that animal's bite is 1,200 pounds of force. So that's a lot. That's a huge amount. All right, so I do have one more poll for you guys. I'm gonna share with you, this works here, don't look. Um, let's see, bite force. All right, out of these, which one do you guys think has the strongest bite force of any animal in the world? Is it a great white shark, grizzly bear, saltwater crocodile, or a hippo? What do you guys think? I'll give you a couple seconds here to answer those. No one's voting for the grizzly bear, huh? All right. Oh, there's a couple people voting for the grizzly bear, so. All right, I see a lot of hippo. Some crocodile, some shark. Three people said grizzly bear. All right, well, I will tell you we had hippo was the winner with 59% said that the hippo was the winner. It is not the hippo, but you guys are close. So it is actually the great white shark um, but in all honesty, it is the saltwater crocodile. So let me explain. So when we talk about bite force, um, they need large muscles, they need lots of teeth, they need a big mouth, they need to be able to open their mouth very big. So when we talk about this, we always think lions as like this 
quintessential predator um, for the Great Plains. They have a very puny bite force. It's only about 650 pounds per square inch. When you think about like a Rottweiler, the Rottweiler that you can have in your house is 328. Uh, tigers are a little bit more, spotted hyenas are very high, grizzly bears about 1200, so same as a gray wolf. Um, when we talk about saltwater crocodile, the largest bite force ever measured was from a 17 foot saltwater crocodile at 3,700 pounds per square inch. That's huge. That is like a huge amount of force. The great white shark actually beat it, but it was 21 feet long. That's a huge, huge animal. Um, most great white sharks do not get that big. So on average with body size, what we're going to actually find, saltwater crocodiles deliver more bite force than a great white shark. Um, the odds of finding a 21 foot great white shark every single time that you do that bite force test is very low. So that's going to bring their average down a little bit. Saltwater crocodiles tend to be a little bit more um, average in their size, which is about 6 to 15 to 17 foot. So it's going to hover around that 3,700 pounds per square inch. So the actual trophy is going to go to the saltwater crocodile. So for those of you that guessed that, good job. All right, let's go ahead and talk about stings. So um, I think I have, nope, I'm just going to wait on this one. All right, so let's talk about stings. So what is a sting? So stingers are the sharp organs that are found on various animals. They are capable of injecting venom. Remember, venom has to go into your bloodstream. You don't eat it or swallow it. Um, and it pierces your skin to get to that bloodstream. So for instance, when we talk about bees and wasps, they are venomous animals because they're inserting that venom into your bloodstream. So the two greatest risks that we have to worry about with insect stings are gonna be an allergic reaction and an infection. Oftentimes this does not happen, but it can. I'm sure all of you know someone that's allergic to bees or wasps or something. Um, so all insects are gonna use venom, um, although not all stings are venomous. So if an animal stings you, that does not mean that they're going to insert venom. It just means that they're annoyed by you. Um, so venom is believed to give rise to an allergic reaction. That's what makes your little, um, your skin kind of welt up or make a red bump or be itchy or something like that. It could produce lesions. Um, extreme cases are going to have um, like increased heart rate, perspiration. Um, they possibly might have a severe allergic reaction but otherwise it's gonna go away in about a week. So nothing really to worry about. First thing that animals, most people think about when they sting are gonna be bees. So just like um, animals can bite um, because they feel scared or threatened or they're protecting something, bees feel the same way. They're not just these jerk animals that are out there to sting you. Um, they feel threatened or they're disturbed or pr they're protecting their hive. Um, there's a reason that they are stinging you. Um, when bees sting, they release a chemical called melatonin into the victim. So this venom immediately triggers pain receptors, causing that burning sensation. So I've never had a bee sting, but I'm sure some of you have. And if you have had it, apparently it's a burning um, right at the site of injection right away. Um, the first thing that you want to try and do is get that stinger out. Um, if you are stung by a honeybee, it actually disembowels the bee. So once they sting you, their whole stinger and like the bottom half of their body comes out. Um, and in a short while after that, honeybees are going to die because um, they can't live after that. Um, their stinger is barbed. So what they always tell you to do is use like a credit card or something and kind of just flick that stinger out of your skin. Um, the longer that that stays in there, the more venom it's going to release up until about a minute. So if you can immediately get that thing out of you, if not, um, it just will produce a little bit more venom. But again, it's only up until about a minute. It's not like it, if you leave it in the rest of your life, it's going to keep continuing to put venom inside of you. That's not how it works. All right, so some myths about bees um, and how they sting you is that honeybee hive, um, it's the female workers that actually sting you. The male drones do not have stingers. The queens do have stingers, but they rarely leave the hive to use it. So if you get stung by a bee, it's more than likely going to be a female worker bee. Um, there are species of stingless bees um, they're found in the same family as things like bumblebees and honeybees. Um, they have a stinger, but it's actually a modified ovipositor. So it's what they use to lay their eggs or um, release their eggs. So it's ineffective for defense. Uh, carpenter bees, which we have in Nebraska, they appear sometimes to fly at your face. Um, however, they cannot sting you. They're just like, hey, look at me. I'm scary. I'm a bee. Most people don't know the difference. Leave me alone. So 
um, when they do that, it's mostly just that I'm scary, but I'm, I can't actually sting you. Um, bumblebees can sting, um, although it rarely happens. Um, they're pretty, pretty gentle, docile animals unless you, um, you know, pick them up and try to crush them or you step on them or something. They're not going to like that. So they're more than likely going to sting you. Um, but again, it's the females that are doing that. And there are things that are solitary bees. Um, stings are very rare. Um, even when they do have a stinger. They're just not the aggressive types of, um, of stingers. All right, so wasps. Um, wasps are the ones, sometimes people call them yellow jackets, same thing. Um, they sting because they feel threatened. So oftentimes bees are the guys they are gonna sting over and over and over again. It's not like a one and done, like a, a, um, a bumblebee or a honeybee. So this is their defense mechanism. It also, they use this venom to capture their prey. Um, when someone has an allergic reaction to a wasp or a yellow jacket, we call that anaphylaxis. And sometimes you go into anaphylaxis shock if you are stung multiple times by a lot of different things. Again, that's very rare, but it does happen. Um, so these are the guys that will sting you multiple times because their stinger is smooth. It is not barbed like the bee. So once they sting you, they can retract it and do it again, and do it again, and do it again as much as they want to. Um, only females are going to be the ones that sting, and oftentimes when they start stinging, they will release a pheromone or a chemical in the air that says, hey guys, come, uh, come sting, we're having a sting party over here, and they, rest of their soldier bees just, or uh, wasps just come and start stinging you. So a lot of the times it might be one that comes up to you, and then all of a sudden you're going to get a bunch more because they release that pheromone that says, hey, come, come sting, it's fun. So these are the guys that are the kind of jerk. Um, insects of the world. Um, these are the ones that um, a lot of people say they want to sting you. Again, they feel threatened. They're disturbed. They don't like something. All right. I want to talk to you about cicada killer wasps because I've had a lot of people actually email me the last week um, asking about these insects. So these guys get fairly large in Nebraska. They are a type of wasp. Um, they are mostly active in the hot summer months, the dog days of summer, um, because they eat cicadas. At the same time, that cicadas are going to be around. They're solitary wasps um, and the females are going to be the ones with the stinger, but they don't use it for people. They can, but the reason that they have that stinger and the reason that they have that venom is to paralyze cicadas. They drag them into their burrows that they made, they lay their eggs on them, and then their eggs, their developing eggs, are going to be the ones that actually eat those cicadas. So they have something to eat underground. Um, these guys you're going to be noticing um, we have a couple of them that are out by our mailbox. They dig this extensive burrow. Um, they can move about 100 square inches, I think, of um, 100 square centimeters of dirt very quickly. So if you see this little mound, like an anthill, sometimes that's going to be those cicada killer wasps. Um, the adult females, they actually eat nectar. They, they don't really care about you. You're in their way, but they're not trying to sting you. They're not usually aggressive towards people, not territorial. The males are, but they don't have the stingers. Um, if anything, these things are mostly thought of as pests to homeowners because they, um, they dig around your gardens, they dig by your sidewalks, they can cause a lot of erosion problems, but again, they're not out there to get you. Um, so I am curious to see if anyone has seen one of these yet this year. So if you guys can really quick give you a couple seconds to answer that. Um, if you have, totally fine. If not, um, just kind of curious to see if people are seeing them. So I just saw my first one last week, like I said. So um, about a couple more weeks into August, you'll start seeing a lot more. So looks like mm, about 60, 30, yes and no. So all right, well, thanks for answering. I'm just kind of curious, so. All right, we're almost done here. Got a couple more things. So Hornet, so if you remember when this whole COVID thing started, it was just like one thing after another. And I think the month of what, April, May was murder hornet month. Um, we don't have to worry about them necessarily. They are not native to North America. They have been introduced into the coast areas, um, but they are not um, from North America. They're not native. Um, you're mostly found in tropical Asia, Europe, Africa. They are a subset of wasps. Um, they're a little bit thicker in the middle and they're usually fairly large um, when we talk about them compared to wasps. These guys can also sting over and over and these are gonna be extremely aggressive animals. So um, we don't necessarily have to worry about them. If you see them, they are an introduced species, not a native species to North America. All right, 
scorpions. Um, so this one was super hard to find information about this because there were so many differing um, characteristics and records and yes, I've seen one. Yes, we have them as native species. So we have records of them in Nebraska. Um, I talked to one of the guys at UNL Entomology, so I know this information is correct. Um, we have records of northern scorpions and then we call them striped bark scorpions in Nebraska. The striped bark scorpions, they're the most broadly distributed scorpion in the United States. They pretty much live in every single habitat, uh, pine forests, deserts, deciduous forests. They're quite uncommon in Nebraska, but they have records of them. They can also dry sting you, just like a, a snake can dry bite. Um, they can decide when to sting and how much. So there's two different types of stings for a scorpion. Um, there's something called the pre-venom and there's full venom. So what they can do is the pre-venom, um, they will use that oftentimes to kind of disorient their prey or make it easier for them to eat it. Um, but oftentimes they don't, um, they don't sting. They save the full venom for things like larger prey or if you're bothering them or disturbing them. So um, they're pretty harmless, honestly, if you leave them alone. Um, a lot of times when I went to Africa, we found them and you flip a rock and there'd be a couple scorpions and they just sit there like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You put the rock back and you leave them alone. So um, there, you can sometimes find them on the border, the south, southern northern border of Kansas and Nebraska. They sometimes cross over because they are in Kansas, but we don't actually have um, them quite often in Nebraska. So um, the pre-venom contains lots of salts, while the full venom contains lots of proteins. So it affects the impulses in the heart and the blood vessels. So some can be very venomous. Um, once you get to the desert southwest, Arizona, New Mexico area, um, in Africa, they're a big deal, but in Nebraska, we don't often see them, but we do have seen them before. All right, so that is all that I have for you guys. Um, I do want to make sure that you join me next week for the Science of Predators. Um, so this is going to be same time, Thursday, July 30th from 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about predators and how predators um, help part of the ecosystem, how, they, um, how we control our predator populations, how they stop the spread of disease, lots of different things. We're going to talk about every kind of predator, uh, mountain lions, coyotes, snakes, ladybugs, they're predators too. Um, so we're going to talk about lots of different times. All right, the next three weeks, we got three more of these. Um, we're going to do the science of predators next week. August 6th, we're going to do the science of animal love, one of my favorite things to talk about. And then the last one, we're going to talk about the science of animal myths. So same time, Thursday, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you guys happen to miss today, and know someone that wanted to tune in or if you missed next week or the last couple weeks, we do have them up on our um, Game and Parks website and I can put that in the chat box for you um, under online education for Game and Parks and you can watch the recordings um, anytime you want. So thanks everyone. Um, I'm going to unmute you guys here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will unmute you and check for um, chat. So if someone has a question, let's see. I'm gonna box my participants here. Um, there we go. Unmute. Yeah. All I right. see there's a question about um but I need your help. Uh, what was it? Oh. Kickers and okay. Well, thank you for calling. <laughs> thank you. You have a good day. All right, Some bye. Kickers, yeah. Um, let's see. I have a couple people. Yep. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I had. I knew someone was going to ask this. Ticks do not fall from trees. People thought that for the longest time that they would sit there and wait, and then That's when they walk by, they dropped on you. Not true. Um, they're usually in tall grasses, and they stand there with their arms up, and then you walk by, they grab on you, or a dog, or whatever you walk by. Um, we do not have corn snakes in Nebraska. They are Iowa, South Dakota, Kansas. We don't have the thing off. All right. All right. Someone said, if I understand you, milk snake has coloring. 
Um, yes, milk snakes in Nebraska look very similar to coral snakes, but the um, the way the pattern is, it depends. Um, if you've ever heard um, red touches yellow, your dead fellow, um, there's a little poem that goes along with that. It's just what order those bands are in. So in Nebraska, we just don't simply have um, coral snakes. They're just not the right habitat for them. Little um, they're not very big. Um, let's see. Monica, they want to know if chiggers bite or sting. Chiggers bite or sting. They are biters. Yeah, I was going to yes, put them in there. I could have put in things like fleas and it, it just would have been like an hour long presentation. So yes, chiggers bite. Um, they're not stingers. Good question. Um, someone asked what a dry sting was. So um, a dry sting, just like a dry bite. Um, so snakes, scorpions, they can decide when to envenomate. So if they do decide to sting you or bite you, they don't have to release that venom. Um, venom is very expensive or energy. It's a lot of energy to build that up. And so that's like their absolute last resort. Same with snakes and scorpions. They don't want to use it if they don't have to. Um, scorpions glow under black uh, under UV light. Yes, they do. I'm pretty sure all species do. Um, not exactly sure, but possibly. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Let's see. I think that's all the, the difference between male and female cicada killer wasps. Yes, females are the ones that have the stingers. Males do not. Um, they're the ones that are killing the uh, cicadas as well. And if everyone's like, oh, poor cicadas. Cicadas actually hurt a lot of our trees, so um, it's okay to have a couple of cicadas kind of disappear. Shut your mic off. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm going to go back to the gallery view here, so if I miss you, I'm so sorry. Does anyone have any questions? I thought I heard someone say, excuse me, do you have a question? Excuse me, yes. Yeah, yeah, do you guys have a question? Yes. Is there any bugs that sting that put in, in venom that gives you headaches? Ooh, that's a good question. Are there any insects that sting you and put the venom and give you headaches? I have no idea. That's a really good question. Well, I do um, have a headache. That's why you, I got that. Oh, person. you have a headache. Do you think you were stung or bitten by <laughs> And also, I am sorry that you have mosquito bites, but once I had a mosquito bite right on my head. Oh, those so are not I fun. I really know what they Yeah, like. they are not fun, especially yeah. when they're on your face. That's what it's not fun. That one has it. Um, Monica, in answer to your question about the scorpions glowing, yes. If they okay. glow under UV light, they are scorpions, and the fact that they glow is one of the things that is used to differentiate from mimics that are trying to look like scorpions and real scorpions is if it glows when you hit it with the light it's a scorpion and if it looks like a scorpion but doesn't glow it's pretending oh, okay. uh, i did not know that do you know what the like why they glow like is there a certain chemical on that body? we haven't figured out um, okay. Because it's it's universal to the scorpions. There are all sorts of theories. Some people were saying, well, they can tell when it's the moonlight versus the sunlight. I mean, but the sun has even more UV than the moon. Um, and so, not sure why. Okay, that's awesome. I had no idea. I knew they glowed under light, but I wasn't sure if it was all speed. That's really cool. That's interesting. Yeah, See, I yeah. think you. I am by no means an expert. Yeah. Um, on any of this so um we get asked that a lot when we're presenting scorpions at the zoo so it's it's one of the things they prepared us to be able to answer um then make sure that we have good batteries in our uv flashlight yes um for those of you that ask where these will be housed um i'm gonna yeah. type in here all right, so me. if you go to Outdoor Nebraska, all right, I'm just going to mute everybody for right now. Um, we're uh, on uh, OutdoorNebraska.gov slash online education. So if you, I will send this to everybody here. All right, if you go there and then you click on the nature videos tab. Um, that is where they're going to be. So outdoornebraska.gov slash online education. There's a bunch of different tabs. There's some lesson plans. There's some coming up next kind of things. It's under the nature videos tab and you can watch um, today's will probably be on there tomorrow or Monday. 
but you can watch the scat one that we did last week. And then you can also watch the animal tongues one that was two weeks ago. So once we get all of them done, they will be up there for a while. All right. I think that is about it. If anyone has any more questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I will check the chat here one more time. Don't think I missed anything. Don't touch it, please. Please stop touching it. Move, please. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Does someone have a question? Yeah. Because you can't listen. Yeah. You can't listen. No, your work. Know your work. Collectively mute someone, can you? I don't know who is talking right now. So Otherwise, they totally would mute. <clears throat> it says Robert Beagle. There we go. He, he keeps glowing. He will. Uh, it's all right. Um. Yes. What was their question? Does someone okay, have Michael. A question? Someone have okay. a question? Yeah, you mentioned about the wasps. You said it was almost like a sting party. I thought they call on the other wasps for like backup. They do, yeah. So that is that special chemical that they will release, those pheromones. They kind of say, hey, everybody, I'm stinging. I need some help. This is a large prey. This is a predator. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. So they call in their troops or their soldiers so that they can come and help them. Um, a lot of times it's for like a big person or something that's disturbing them. They do not want to be disturbed or they're in danger of their hive being, um, or their nest area being disturbed or threatened. So that's why they're gonna call in for backup. Yeah, good, good point. Right, and just to let you know, a pheromone is like a smell that would be given off. Yes, we know that. I figured you were that smart. <laughs> That's All right. right. Anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, please feel free to email me. Um, hey, Monica. Yeah. There's a there's a question here. Um, wondering if her her emailed questions would be answered because her classroom is watching. Okay. Um. Yes. Let me. Let's see, I gotta find that email. I did forward it on to our Wild What's Up as they are the kind of the one. Um, but let me see if I can answer this. Yeah. Um, all right, so she asked, what is the most deadly sting and what animal does it come from? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, well, it depends. You got to talk about are we in Nebraska or are we somewhere else? Yes, there's a lot more. In Nebraska, we're pretty safe um, as far as like dangerous kind of items go. Um, so, in Nebraska, it just kind of depends. If I, not that I know of, but if I got bit by a bee or I stung by a bee, it might be very different than someone that is allergic to that as well. So that could be very, very be deadly to them, or it could, um, it just kind of depends on how your body reacts to it. Some people are allergic, some people are not. Um, what's the most deadly bite? Um, Again, are we in Nebraska? Are we looking at something else? Um, I'd probably say within the world, it would be like the, the sea snake. They say that's one of the, or anything in that um, Alapidae family. Um, they're one of the most, they have the most deadly bite out of anything. Um, what is the bite force of a lion? Uh, 650 uh, pounds per square inch. She also asked, what is the most venomous snake bite? Um, again, it's the sea snakes, the sea, I think it's the, the banded sea snake, um, it just has the highest concentration of venom. Uh, what is the bite force of a hippo? Uh, I think that was about like 1850 pounds per square inch. So, um, hopefully that answers, uh, Casey, your question. So yeah, does someone else have a question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Oh, guy down here. Um. Some, uh, I heard someone say once before, uh, bees know that if they sting, they'll die, so they bite. Is that true? I'm sorry, what did you say? Um, somewhere I heard that uh, bees know that they're going to die if they sting, so they bite sometimes instead. Would that be true? I don't think that bees can bite you. Um, their mouths are so small, but I'm not sure that they can... Um, I don't think that they can bite you, but I, I, they, I, I assume that they know 
that they're gonna they're gonna die. But my guess is that they're doing that to protect um, their hive, or it's kind of their job to protect. So um, I don't know, but that's a really good question. I can certainly look and figure that yeah, out. Yeah, and then you know I think the whole pheromone thing goes in on that. So if one bee stings, the other bees are gonna come in and a attack whatever is disturbing the hive. Thank you. I appreciate that. Again, I am no means an expert, so I appreciate well, all the help on this. And my understanding is that bees can sting other bees without necessarily having the harpoon stay in. That's why queen bees can battle each other, and the one who wins has stung her component or her opponents out and got taken care of them. But she can still go on and you know start her own hive. Um, wow! But if they sting us, we're big enough. Again, they're leaving that thing behind, letting it pump in extra venom, and that for the workers is going to be a suicide moment. Um, but workers can fight other bees uh, to an extent. I mean, if they get it stuck in the wrong way, it's going to pull out and they're they're going to die. But so there isn't a you know it depends on what they're stinging. Uh, does that make sense? And help, Thank Paris. You. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank great you. information, Judy. You well, you got some great stuff there, Renee. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you guys being on. So, all right, any other questions? Monica, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk just a, just a sentence or two about the Komodo dragon? <laughs> We're in Nebraska. Come on, bro. You don't have them there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also at the zoo. As much as I wish we had Komodo dragons. So there is some debate on whether they are poisonous or venomous. Um, do they have just a really bad infection? This has been kind of a debate for from herpetologists for a long time. Um, I think the last thing that I read is that they have a special, in their saliva, when they bite something, they have a special chemical. I can't remember for the life of me what it's called. Um, but what happens is that they, when they bite then they, um, they leave that chemical behind. But I, I am not 100% sure. Um, let's see, who, Don? I'm remembering that, yeah, I'll Google it. Yeah. What'd it's you say? Attic. I'll Google I'm it. I'm remembering, oh. Oh, go, go, go. Um, I can't pull up my vet, my animal sheet right now because I still, without closing the Zoom. Um, but oh. I'm remembering that they did find enzymes in their saliva and how much of that's just a digestive enzyme that's causing problems and, you know, not specifically designed to kill the host um, and how much of that is interacting specifically with the other gunk that's in there, all the bacteria and everything else. But they had found enzymes uh, that were produced by the Komodo dragons that is in their saliva. And again, they don't particularly have any injecting mechanisms. Um, and I thought, isn't the uh, Gila monster or something else? It's not the Gila monster, one of the others. But there, there are two now known uh, lizards that have something that can be, if you're generous, called venom. Yeah, uh, the, the Gila monster is one that's in North America. Um, there's a beaded lizard that looks very similar to it. Um, but the Gila monster is like our the one venomous species that I know of. If there's two now, then great. Um, so, but yes, they are... Um, a couple of years ago, I want to say someone at the Omaha Zoo got nicked or cut or bit or something by one of the Gila monsters. By one of the, they, uh, no, monsters. by one of the Komodo dragons. Oh, okay. Okay. She, there was she, she someone got, with the Gila monster too when I interned there, but that was yeah. a long time ago. So, um, yeah, the one that got the news about what, four years ago was yep, one of the ladies who that. had one of our small Gila monsters. Um, okay. And just, you know, doing normal stuff with it and got nicked and because of the stuff in there, the anticoagulants, it bled all over the place. Yeah. Um, and I think I think we can all agree that Komodo dragons are like the coolest animal ever. Um, but I do a funny story when I was in third grade. One of the reasons why I got into this, but in third grade, I we wanted, had to do a project on an animal, and I chose a Komodo dragon. And we had to go around and say what animal we were picking. We had to write a book about this animal, and I picked the Komodo dragon. And my third grade teacher kind of started right and she stopped and looked at me and she said okay that's really nice but let's pick an animal that actually exists so um, <laughs> it does exist don't ever let someone tell you that they do not exist um and like six years later they opened the denver zoo cool kono dragon exhibit and i cut out the little newspaper clipping and i sent it to her and said see they do exist so um it's kind of a fun story but don't let anyone ever tell you kono dragons aren't real so <laughs> you're kind of addictive aren't you 
What do you think? You're a little bit vindictive, aren't you? I am. I was so angry because she picked my like, squirrel for me instead. So I had to write a book about a squirrel. And I've kind of As a science it. teacher, I have to say, you know, if you can prove the teacher wrong, you go after it. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the kids had a question. I saw a hand raised. Yeah, does someone have a question? Oh, Maybe actually, they... that was an answer. Oh, okay. an answer? oh great. Yeah, a Komodo dragon has, has a poisonous or venomous bite. Like a, like, 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 like a healer monster. Very cool. You guys are super smart. Where are you guys from? Omaha, Nebraska. From where in Nebraska? Omaha. Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, all right. And thank you for that compliment. You're welcome. Can you, can you say that again? You said the Komodo dragon has a venomous... Venomous or poisonous bite. Bite, okay. I thought I heard something about, well, and you have to imagine every bite is going to have bacteria. You know, just thinking about in the veterinary world, anything that gets bitten is going to, there's bacteria in the mouth, you know, so that's also going to cause an in, initial infection. But I hear what you're saying about the venom. That would be cool, but still, oh, as far as I know, no. She's she, a science she, teacher. She, yeah. she, you guys think about, we should do like a science. No, no, no. Just because I said science teacher does not mean I know anything. But you got to think about the bacteria in your mouth. If you even bit someone, if you bit your arm, you would, if you broke the skin, you would introduce bacteria into your skin. So... Every organism is going to be able to introduce a bacteria, but you're, we're talking about poisons and venom, which is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if anyone has, let's see, I got one more chat here. Thank you so much. Um, all right. This is great. Thank you, everyone, for staying around discussing. We are over our an hour, so I know sitting on a Zoom call for an hour is kind of kind of tiring. So go ahead and get up, go outside, take a break, whatever you need to do. But if you guys have any more information or questions, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, next week, same time, Thursday, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, we'll talk about predators. So um, Bye. again, thank you, thank everyone, you. for showing up. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Monica, if you could hang on for a minute, I have some questions for you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, not relating to this. Um, first of all, uh, the way that you got your, because I have to do virtual learning, how did you get your like questions on there? I've never seen that done before. Oh, your like full the questions? Surveys? Yeah. Um, do you have a Zoom account? Yes. So what you can do, it's in, I wonder if I can even share my screen with you so that you can see how this is done here. Um, well, I, you have me on email, so if you want to just... Oh, no, she puts it on there. The rest of us are going to watch and learn. <laughs> um, yeah. You may not want to know this information. Sometimes it gets a little out there. No, it's... And this is really cool because I just learned how to do this a few weeks ago and it, it's a great way to interact with people. So um, let's see. Um, you go to your settings. So let me see if I can get to my settings here. I'll try and share my screen with you guys. I'm actually going to stop the recording and people don't have to. <laughs> 